Do you see we're just casting a bit of shadow? Mm -hmm. So it just come, yeah, yeah, a bit more frontal like that, yeah. What were you, what were you saying, Quasi? I was just saying that it's hard, it's like, it's really weird to feel like you're this issue in society and that the world is divided with how much they should care about you or how much they should listen to you or how much they should be concerned with issues around your life. It's weird to be uh, like a battleground. They're moving around a lot. You see your hands. Damn, man. Stay in the I'm car. Sorry. Let me I'm see sorry. your other hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Let sorry. me see your other please. hand. Please, please. Both hands. Do nothing. Put hey, your fucking please. hands please. up please. right now. I was feeling just mad at the world. Yeah, I was in just in a bit of a dark place. I wanted to make the film because I want to change that for other people. This is not a conversation that I wanted to have. Um, it's not pleasant, but I felt like I had a responsibility to have the conversation and to tell my story at this time when people are willing to listen. It felt like a particular opportunity. You felt in the past people haven't been? Well, no, they haven't been. Yep. I'm going to grow my afro out after this. Growing up, we moved to all these different towns, and I'd be the only black person there. I would ride the bus home, and I remember this, this kid's little brother who might have been, I don't know, seven or so. He asked me, he said, are you black because you're covered in poo? Like, what does that what does that do to you? You know that like just destroys you and you're you're just uh, you're just there and you're alone and maybe a couple of people care. Most people say nothing. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I I was like ten years old, you know? This was 6 a.m. There was nobody in this parking lot. So that's what made me scared. Like, usually, you know, you grow up in an area that I grew up in, which is Parkdale, usually you're used to that stuff. But the fact that I was by myself, I was scared. I know I was scared. Hey, I was 18 years old and I got pulled over by the police and they uh, ID'd me. It was like seven in the morning. I was on my way to work. And I was in an abandoned parking lot. And, and so I remember they stopped me and he took my ID. And I remember the officer, he put my identification in to the, to the computer and nothing came up. And then I saw his reaction and he deleted the transaction or the whatever again and put my information in again like the first time was a mistake. Like, he definitely must have something on him. And I watched the whole thing. And I'm like, he wouldn't do this for a white kid walking around. It's, it's not normal for me not to have a criminal record. You know, that, that's what it said to me. Like, I'm, I'm outside what they think should be normal.
I grew up in Toronto in Flemington Park. So from a socioeconomic standpoint, I was, you know, a child of a single mom. We lived in Ontario housing, and the majority of the people who lived there were black people or new to Canada who were passing through. I had a perception that all black people were poor. Black people didn't own cars. Black people didn't own houses. Black people worked and you didn't depend on welfare. You worked hard, physical labor, and it was just kind of the thing, the way things were. White people were the rich people. <laughs> so crazy. Like white people were rich and black people were poor. But it was kind of like, this is how it is. And never really thinking that there would, could be a different way. It's been interesting. I feel that for us, um, I sometimes will let your dad go ahead of, of me. I do, there's been times where I, I would say, can you use your white male privilege? We joke <laughs> about it, like that's just our little, you know, internal <laughs> joke, but I'll say, can you use your white male privilege and go in there and get this for me? I forget, I've done it a couple of times. Yeah, so we were just talking about perspective. And so I asked your dad today, I said like, did you ever see or feel in our families, like when we first got together? I know my grandmother wasn't very pleased. Yeah. If you remember when I when we first started dating, she uh, she told me that she was going to cut me out of the will if I married a black woman, and uh, I said, okay, that's fine. You can do what you need to do if that's what you want, but I'm not going to let that determine my decision. likely to have a, a lighter skin child as it is like a little bit of a darker skin child. So then in, in that same exact thought when I'm thinking, okay, so if we have a son who's dark, here's what I'm going to teach him. I'm thinking, okay, so if we have a son who's white or lighter, yeah, how are we going to talk to him about race and his identity? And we likely won't have to have the same conversations about like, don't wear your hood up, don't walk with your hands in your pockets, like all that. Um, but there's definitely still going to need to be a conversation that happens in regards to race and whatnot. I, and I still have so much to learn. Like, I still feel kind of not lost, but just like scared, I guess. Scared and a bit unequipped to like help our children walk through this world with the way it is. But I'm just gonna keep learning and reading and listening. I've been living with by myself for a really long time. But I've been feeling that way, and then so the whole world being like, oh, like you probably went through some stuff. Then it, it opened up all of those scars for me, and it was just a really painful time. It was like everyone was looking at me, and it was, it was like those things I would rather, maybe this isn't for the better though, but I would rather not have to be thinking about them all the time. That's, that, that's what's exhausting. You, you, you can't, you can't show strength. You can't show um, self-reliance or, or we were talking about pride. You can't show that and, and not be called angry. That's tiring. That's tiring, bro. <sighs> 
We're not angry, man. We're just tired, bro. First, when I saw the video, I was like, well, what did he do? And I kind of just, I was, I was numb to it. Like, I hate to admit that I was so numb to the video. I was like, I actually didn't even watch. I was like, yeah, okay, like, in another one. It was just, it's so sad. And I, I'm, I feel angry at myself a little bit that I'd become so numb to watching police brutality against black men in particular. What we think of as policing is the metaphysical reassertion of slavery. Pure and simple. Insofar as it restricts freedom of mobility and removes that right again? Yeah, that's right. Or forces us to constantly monitor ourselves and, and to constantly be under surveillance. You walk into a store, somebody follows you around, or somebody's watching you on a camera, et cetera, et cetera. Abolition and emancipation. Yeah. The way we've inherited it is is the is the ground based understanding that black people don't really deserve to be free. Because hmm. we can't really be trusted with our freedom. And besides, it's far more beneficial for mainstream society to have us as polite, courteous, cheap labor. Mm -hmm. That's the best possible way for us to exist in the society. I think it in the background of psychology of, of our societies. Right. This is the inheritance of slavery. Mm -hmm. And we're also good for entertainment and also good for sports. Being a black person in North America is confusing. Yeah. It messes you up psychologically. <laughs> It's like you're in someone else's world and like you're this weird person and you know, like you're, you're not the beauty standard, you're not the... Yeah. It's a weird thing to be black here. I felt within the past few months that I've been the token friend. Oh, I'm not racist because I have a biracial friend, so therefore I'm not racist. But yeah, I hear you saying the M word, so I, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've definitely noticed in my friend group who's actually there because of my personality or because they just, want to have a friend that's not white. I think another thing that's really important is to not be satisfied with not being racist. And I, I, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, I'm not racist. OK, well, then that's it. There's nothing else to talk about. I'm not racist. Mm. Like, you don't want to just say to your kid, if like, oh, I don't hate you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't hate you. Don't worry. I don't hate you. Not at all. <laughs> it's like, no, let me show you that I love you. <laughs> and there's so many experiences that you both mentioned, and I, I've had as well, with like a non, uh, with uh, white teachers, like being super encouraging, and meaning, and it meaning the world. Like I, I've had that as well, and it's like, loving takes you further than not hating. <laughs> so, because yeah. to love someone is to know what hurts them, and to, and that opens the door to conversations. You're gonna be uncomfortable before you get comfortable, and the fear of saying the wrong thing often leads people to say nothing. Mm -hmm. When you start the conversation, you now give permission for that black person to have the conversation because I'm not going to my white friends and saying, hey, I've been thinking about something. It generally doesn't work that way. Yeah. We are already in our heads going, I don't know what they're thinking and all kinds of stories going yeah, on. Yeah. So get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because we've been deprived so long of the permission and the confidence to now know that reformation is going to take time, it's like, wow, I gotta wait now. I gotta wait more, I gotta wait. And it's like, yes, in some ways you do have to wait mm -hmm. for a widespread of reformation, 
but you can make some major steps individually. I want to see change. I, I definitely want to see immediate change, but I think we, we all know that when it comes to anything worthwhile, it takes time, mm -hmm. for sure. I have hope, I have faith, and I just think we're more active now than we ever were. Beautiful. As machines tumbled from side to side, we found ourselves between the lines, pulled and stretched across darkened skies, smeared on edges like city lines, seen and yet forgotten. An abyss yet still concrete. How did it feel to be unseen? A dying man beneath a knee. A battleground. As fires grow and fearing seeps, a child's born, unknowing, weeps. His destined fate, though still unknown, is inscribed in skin, engraved in bone. Battleground. So here he lays, still yet to rise, between the sides, beneath your eyes. His story reads, as millions say, the overcast, the undercame. He's yet to breathe. Who's to blame? The battleground. <laughs> <laughs> 